Matthew 15, verses 29 through 31. The multitude marveled is the name of this particular message. Um, it's interesting to me to note that we're going to be looking at miracles, and one in particular, a miracle of healing that the Lord does. And uh, it's, it's interesting how the Lord teaches me lessons concerning healings and all, because yesterday I was washing my car, and, and I filled a bucket with water, and I was bending down to lift the bucket up to move it, and my back went completely out on me. And so my lower back right now, uh, it's actually blessed the Lord. He's, he's been very kind to me today. But my lower back is, um, it feels like there's a, a nail that's red hot that's from the spine all the way to the right hip and down to my knee. And so I was telling the first service that um, it's interesting I'm teaching on healing and I've been asking God to touch me, but he loves other people more than me. But anyway, I'll, I'll speak <laughs> about a God who heals because indeed our God does. And I thank God that I was able to teach first service and prayerfully uh, without any problem. Um, I'll be going through second service also and thanking the Lord for, uh, for his goodness to us. So beginning in verse 29, reading to verse 31, Matthew writes, And Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them those who were lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. They laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they glorified the God of Israel. What I'm going to do, just so that you're prepared for this, is I'm going to give you a, an introduction, give you some details to set the context. This is, after all, a Bible study. We're going to do that. Then what I'm going to do is conclude with some application. And I believe that the application is helpful for us to understand the ways of the Lord as it pertains to this particular passage. And as I mentioned, I'm also going to cross-reference this with a, a portion of Scripture in the uh, Gospel of Mark that gives to us uh, some insight that is not given to us here in Matthew 15. And so at a certain point, I'm going to have you turn with me to uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, and you'll see that in just a moment. But let me begin by laying down a foundation, giving you an introduction so that we have a context whereby we can understand what the point is here in verses 29 through 31 of Matthew, chapter 15. We know that Jesus has been ministering in a region of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon, as I mentioned to you before, is in southern Lebanon just north of the nation of Israel. We have seen that Jesus cast out a demon from a young girl at the request of her mother, a Canaanite woman. And Jesus, at this point, doesn't desire to enter into Galilee, so he skirts it by going east towards the Sea of Galilee. Now, Mark's gospel gives us more insight because in Mark 7, 31, Mark wrote, Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee, and into the region of the Decapolis. Now, Jesus leaves the area of Tyre, goes through Sidon, continues south to the Sea of Galilee. Notice again, he made his way into the region of the Decapolis. The Decapolis, the word Decapolis is a, is a word that says ten cities. Deca is ten in Greek, polis is city. It's the region of the ten cities that Jesus is going to, which is east of the Jordan River. Now, early in the ministry of Christ, we saw in chapter 4, verse 25, that he had made a great impact. Jesus made a great impact on the people of that region. Because Matthew tells us in chapter 4, verse 25, great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. When we were looking at his works, one of his great miracles that he did was in the region of the Decapolis in an area called the Gatherings. That's where he had delivered two demonized men who were living in the tombs. Now, Matthew mentioned there were two, but the other gospel writers concentrated on only one. And when we looked at that particular portion of Scripture, this man who lived in the Decapolis, 
This man was severely demonized because he was inhabited by a multitude of demons. When you see the conversation between Christ and this one particular spokesman of the two, Jesus says, what is your name? And the man responds, legion. And then we're told it's because there were many demons living within him. And so he saw Jesus, he approached him, and, and he declared to him, we know who you are. And in this conversation, after the encounter, Jesus delivered him from his tortured condition. Luke tells us in chapter 8, verse 35, that a crowd soon gathered around Jesus, for they wanted to see for themselves what had happened. They saw the man who had been possessed by demons sitting quietly at Jesus' feet, clothed and seen, and the whole crowd was afraid because the Lord had delivered this man who had kept them terrorized. Well, Jesus now returns to the area to reap what has been sowed earlier, and he enters into that region, and great multitudes once again come to him with their needs. Now, I noted with you last time we were together that Tyre was located some 12 miles from the border between Israel and Lebanon. If you were looking at a map of California and you reduced it to scale, it would be like California and Oregon's border. And Tyre and Sidon would be to the north. So Tyre is 12 miles from the border and then Sidon is another 20 miles to the north. And so I say that because uh, in order for Jesus to go to the area of the Decapolis, it says here that he first went to the north. So he went north, then went east, and returned south. So that detour into Lebanon and back would have taken several weeks. He ends up in the region of the Decapolis. Decapolis, as mentioned, ten cities. They were semi-independent Gentile cities, and it's region is just south of modern Golan Heights today. Now, verse 29 tells us that Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down there. So he's not close to a populated city. He's on a mountain slope. And as that's taking place, verse 30 says, great multitudes came to him, having with them those who were lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. They laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he heal them. So while in this region, the news that he's there spreads. People begin to come to him. These are people, as mentioned earlier, who are already familiar with his ministry, and they're coming to Christ because they want him to help. It's like what it says in Psalm 27, verse 7, where the psalmist said, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. And that's what's taking place. This crowd, this multitude comes. Now, I want to develop this a bit further by taking you to Mark chapter 7 and showing you something there. Would you please turn with me to Mark chapter 7? We're going to look at verses 32 through 37. Because Mark 7, 32 through 37, supplies us with a, a miracle that is not mentioned in the other Gospels. Somebody says, I'm new to this. Where's Mark at? Mark's in heaven, but his book is the next one to the right. So in Mark chapter 7, verse 32, Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears. And he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to them, Ephaphatha, which is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. They were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. So we're going to spend some time looking at this. I'm going to develop this with you because we've just seen in Matthew's gospel that multitudes came, but this is an incident here that gives to us some insight concerning how the Lord works in healing. 
So beginning here in verse 32, and I'll start again as if I'm introducing this passage. Notice how it says in verse 32 of Mark chapter 7, that they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. It would seem that he had become deaf and could, could speak only with great difficulty due to an illness. And Jesus is going to do a miracle in terms of his healing this man. As we look at this together, we need to remember something about miracle. You see, there are a lot of people today who speak concerning miracles and on. There are purposes to miracles. A miracle, by definition, is something that man cannot do. It is something that God can do. A miracle that is performed by God will always result in, in glory being given to God. A miracle performed by God is never going to result and someone giving glory to the person who supposedly performed it. The miracle is always intended to draw attention to the God who performs it. And what we have here is we have a miracle and many miracles that are taking place. We need to know that miracles weren't performed by Jesus in a haphazard fashion, simply by whim or emotion. They weren't performed to provide excitement, and they certainly were never performed to provide entertainment for bored people. Jesus didn't perform them to have a following alone or to gain financial prosperity from performing them. When you read your New Testament, you're going to note that there are some 37 miracles recorded in the New Testament performed by Jesus Christ. And the purpose of performing the miracles was one of the ways of establishing the credentials of Jesus' ministry. In John's Gospel, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John said Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so the miracles were performed not for entertainment, the miracles were performed not by whim or fancy. They weren't done haphazardly. A miracle was performed to draw people's attention to Christ, that they might believe in him. Now, Mark included this miracle to confirm that Jesus is Messiah. The Apostle Peter makes reference to the credentials of Christ when he was preaching in Acts 2.22, where he said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. So this confirmed that Jesus is Messiah. And the kind of miracle that Jesus is performing here in Mark is one that was prophesied that Messiah would perform. When you look in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 3 through 6, in those verses... Messiah is being spoken of and the things that the Messiah of Israel would do. Again, I'm laying this down so you'll know that Jesus was performing miracles so people would believe that he's the Son of God and that people could have life in his name and that they established his credibility as well as his credentials. And so in Isaiah chapter 35, verses 3 through 6, this is what is called a messianic prophecy. This relates to the Messiah to come. And it says there, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way, say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. And so these works that are listed for us in Matthew, and this work that we're looking at, was intended to draw people's attention to Jesus as Messiah. So as this is taking place, notice what it says in verse 32, how it says that they begged Jesus, notice, to put his hand on him. Again, in the years that I've been ministering, I've had on more than one occasion, people ask me, what is the symbolism of the laying on of hands? Because you see laying on of hands in the Old as well as the New Testament. What is the symbolism of that? 
And the laying on of hands symbolizes God touching man. What they're asking for is a connection with God. It says in Luke chapter 4, verse 40, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And so God touches man through Jesus Christ. And as Jesus is reaching to touch this man, it's also revealing to us his compassion and his love. Now, I don't know if I should share that here. Let me see if I have it somewhere else. Nope, I don't, so I'll share it here. This isn't in my notes, so this is something I think that is important to say. God touched man through Jesus. The world thinks we're mad all the time. Christians are mad. We're mad about everything. We're mad about the music. We're mad about movies. We're mad about everything. Just ask us, we'll tell you. We're mad about parades. We're mad about everything. We're mad that the government has taken away our rights. We are mad constantly. And some things, I think there is a, a holy indignation that we, the church, ought to have. Of course, there were times when Jesus showed indignation. He showed indignation at religious hypocrisy. When Jesus got angry at people, notice with me, he wasn't angry at the sinners, he got mad at the religious people. You see that especially throughout Matthew, but it's highlighted for us in very definite terms in chapter 23. When we get there, we'll have a chance to see Jesus, meek and mild, very angry. I know you're looking forward to that. But the church is mad about everything. We're mad all the time about everything. And we're getting to be known at this time as what we're against and not what we're for. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. God is compassionate and loving. But sometimes we look at people who are unsaved and get mad at them for acting as unsaved people. We get mad because they do the things that they do. We get mad at them and we begin to be angry and pontificate and begin to speak concerning the good old days and this and that. When in fact, it has been said that those in the 50s, more people went to hell in the 50s than any other time in American history. And there's a possibility that that may be true because we had come off of, the, off of the great victory in World War II and many people became complacent. Yes, people went to church, but that doesn't mean that they were all saved. It simply meant it was what they did. And yeah, there was some morality at that time that, that I grew up in and appreciated. Of course, I'll always look back at fondness at some of the things that I was raised to believe and to see and all of that. But that didn't make America a Christian nation. What makes Americans Christians is being born again and, and having your, your sins uh, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we're, we're, we're known for being angry all the time. Now, in the early church, in the first century of the early church, somebody was writing concerning this, and they said, if you were to have been able to ask a non-believing person at that time to describe a Christian, if you were to ask a non-believer to describe a Christian during that day, you'd probably get a different answer in the first century than you get today. Because... In the first century, when God began to pour out his spirit, when the church was birthed and the power of the spirit was alive in the church and the love of God's word was transforming lives, there were those who would make comment concerning Christians, and all you need to do is look up some early comments. You could Google this, uh, comments about early Christians, and you'll see that there are historians that would say things related to Christians loving one another because the mark of the believer, Jesus said, he said it like this, he said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. 
that all of the law and the prophets are summed up in this one word, love thy neighbor as thyself. When the scribe asked Jesus, what is the great command in the law? Jesus said, love God with everything within you and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. How will people know that we're Christians? They will know we are Christians by our love. And though I may lay my life down, though I might give all that I have to the poor, though I do all these sacrificial things, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 said, if I have love, I am nothing. He said, he who loves not knows not God, for God is love. And yet today, the church is mad about everything. We're mad about everything, and we're fighting for our rights, and we're going to demand those things, when in reality, we're to lay our lives down so that people might come to know that there's a Savior. Am I saying that we should allow sin to run rampant? No. I'm saying watch our hearts because we can be angry. Again, if you ask the Old Testament, somebody during the, rather the New Testament church when it first began, if you ask what is a Christian, they'd say he's one who loves. They even call one another brother and sister. They greet one another with a kiss, a holy kiss. They, they're family. But today, if you say, what's a Christian? They're haters. They're against everything. They're mad about everything. And that's unfair. I don't believe that that's true of any of, this, any of us here. I don't believe that at all. But that's the jacket that has been placed on us. We're haters. We're angry because we're not loving the sinners for the sake of Christ. We're mad at them for being sinners. And yet, when people brought someone to Christ, and they said, please, lay your hand on him. It was more than just a rabbi reaching over and grabbing somebody by the shoulder. It was a symbol of God connecting with man. And they knew that Jesus Christ would do that, that he would reach and he would touch them. Why? Because the God you and I serve loves us. He loves us. Sometimes we get healed, sometimes we don't. It's not up to me to determine when he heals us or who he heals. It's up to me to believe that he does heal, and he does. And they would bring their friends, and they brought the crippled, then they brought those in pain to this one that they knew would show compassion. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing in this day, is bringing them to the one who shows compassion. Absolutely. One of our members of our fellowship was speaking to me the other day, just the other day, and was telling me how that he works with uh, an unbeliever who was invited to a church service, and he asked her what she got out of the church service when they reconnected at work, and she was real hesitant to speak, but she finally said, I don't know, I just felt that it was a very angry, angry place to be at. And sometimes churches can feel that way. Listen, I have a lot of passion about a lot of issues, and I know on Wednesday, some of you were with us on Wednesday, I showed some of that passion, and it's there. I'm not, you know, not going to get passionate with you now, but it was there on Wednesday, and it could seem like I'm angry. And in some ways, there's an anger, of course, when I see certain things and I see how people are being deceived, but at the same time, I'm not angry at sinners for being sinners. And Jesus brought, they brought these people to Jesus, and God was touching man as Jesus was touching them. That's his compassion. Now, I want to show you some things here. I want to show you in verse 33, beginning in verse 33 now, when it, after they begged him to put his hands on him, notice verse 33. He took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears, he spat, touched his tongue, looking up to heaven, sighed and said to him, Ephaphatha, which is, be opened. Immediately his ears were opened. The impediment of his tongue was loosed. He spoke plainly. Let's look at that together. First, he takes him aside, verse 33. He took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears. Now, when I read that the first time as a new believer, that grossed me out, I'll be honest. It still does. Marie used to clean the baby's ears. I am, anyway. But he took him aside. First, he took him aside. 
Now, why would he take him aside? Well, probably to make him feel more at ease and to be able to concentrate on what is about to take place. There's a group of people there, a multitude, it says. And so Jesus takes him aside, spends some private time with him. So that reveals to us that there is a personal relationship with him that is of premier importance. He wants to show this man in the midst of a multitude some personal attention. The Lord, by the way, can still do that. There are times when you're being taught a Bible study, regardless of whether it's here somewhere else, and you can be in a group of people, and you know that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. You know that. Even though you may be in the midst of a group, you may be seated amongst others, this is the Spirit of God speaking to you. You can sense it. You know God is doing that. God is saying something to my heart right now. The Lord has a way of doing that. He takes you aside, even in a group, and he says, I want this to be yours. You need to understand this. He took him aside. Now, you see, sometimes it is necessary to get alone with God, to be free of distraction, free of disturbances. It's like what it says in Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. There are times that the Lord wants to speak specifically to you, and here Jesus takes him aside, so it's a personal time with him. Not simply a group experience, but a simple personal time. Then he puts his fingers in his ears. Why would he do that? Well, he did that to signal what he's about to do. By touching him the way that he did, it was, it was provoking anticipation, and it was encouraging him to faith. I'm about to do something and I want you to be provoked to this. I want you to anticipate. I'm about to do something wonderful for you. Psalm 62 verse 5 simply says, My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. Third, he spat and touched his tongue. That would be a visual illustration of what he was to do. He's going to loosen his tongue and then in verse 34, he looked up to heaven and sighed and said to him. Now that indicated the origin of the healing. When he looked up to heaven, Jesus was saying, your healing is going to come from God. We need to remember that Jesus had been accused of doing miracles by the power of Satan. He'd already dealt with the accusation that his power originated with the devil so in looking up to heaven, he was showing who did the work. Like it says in Psalm 30, verse 2, O oh Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. Fifth, he sighed. Again, that reveals his love for the man. He showed this poor man that he cares. That's something all of us need to remember. By the way, I keep saying this. I don't even know why. It's not as if I need to be reminded of this because the Lord reminds me daily. That's the truth. I don't, hope that didn't sound wrong. But daily he, he reminds me that he loves me and cares. Daily. His mercies are renewed every, mo every morning. His compassions fail not. I wake up almost every day remembering what I was. I don't know about you, but the enemy is just waiting for you to wake up so it can whisper, you're scum. I don't know if that happens to you. It happens to me. I wake up, morning scum. First I look at Marie, but she's not awake, so I know it. <laughs> it's somebody else. <laughs> It's been said that when the devil knocks on your door, send Jesus to answer it. Because the enemy likes to remind you of what you've been. And I, I, I have to remember that the sigh of Christ reveals the heart of the Lord for, for, for this man. But by application for us, he breathed deeply and sighed sincerely caring for this guy and showing his compassionate love. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Jesus in, in John chapter 11 has 
a work that he's performing in, in, in a miracle for uh, Lazarus. And uh, Lazarus had died. And in John 11, verses 33 through 36, it, it says, When Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in his spirit and was troubled. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then this is the shortest verse. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. I don't know. I don't think I need to say this again. I say it often. But do you know that God loves you? Do you know that? He does. He does. The other day, I was, uh, Marie and I had the terrible task of having to watch my two-year-old granddaughter, my Zoe. I, I love all my babies, and we had a chance to, to watch her while Mama was gone for a little while. And I sat down, we went to the house, and I sat down on the couch. And it's kind of funny, because when we walk in, I go into another area of the room, and Zoe's upstairs with Mama. And Mama says to Zoe, somebody's here to see you. And I can hear Zoe in the upstairs saying, Papa. And Marie's standing at the foot of the stairs saying, rats, you know. <laughs> Papa. And then Zoe comes walking down the stairs with her mom. And uh, she sees Grandma and steps down and looks at Grandma and smiles and says, where's Papa. And I'm in the kitchen behind her, and she turns, and she comes running to me, and she just holds on to me, and oh, I just love that baby. And we sat down at, on the couch. She just lays back in my arms and lays there for two hours, just laying there. You know, and I learned spiritual lessons, by the way. I don't tell you stories like that to try and endear Zoe to you. I learned spiritual lessons. As I go through life, I say, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Aren't I supposed to rest in the arms of my Savior who loves me? Aren't I supposed to care for him and know that he cares for me? Am I not supposed to come to him and rush to him and hold him and love him? I, I believe so, because he loves me, and, and I understand that. So I keep saying this to you, because I know that love heals hurts. Love heals broken hearts. Instead of us being angry that we got, we got the shaft in life, we ought to say, thank you, God, I got the Savior in life. Jesus came and, and, and he, he, he healed my broken heart. He's transformed me. He's, he's made me new. I bless the Lord. And he has compassion for me. He revealed his love to me. A sixth thing he says to him, be opened in Aramaic. And so as he speaks, he's speaking with authority. His desire is immediately accomplished because in verse 35, it says, immediately his ears were open, the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. So in saying this out loud, the man immediately receives the healing. It says in Psalm 33, verse 9, he spoke, it was done, and he immediately could hear and speak perfectly. And what do you think his first words would have been? We don't know. It isn't said. But I cannot help but wonder if it wasn't simply praise God for the healing that I just received. Praise you for what you've done. We, we saw that in the case of the man of the Gadarenes. It says in Luke 8, 39, that he went his way, proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Proclaiming. What God has done. I cannot help but assume and perhaps read in that he would have been very grateful for the work that Christ did. And I can't imagine that he wouldn't have said thank you to him. We were in uh, New Jersey last week. Some of you noticed I wasn't here. Others didn't. <laughs> and there is a, uh, a festival called Bridge Fest. Uh, on the shore there in New Jersey. We're on the radio in uh, the, uh, the Bridge, which is a radio station that broadcasts in New Jersey all the way up to Connecticut. And we've been on the air there for a long time. And so uh, we had the opportunity of going, and I ministered there. I, 
I ministered at the Bridge Fest on, on Friday, had a chance to meet with some of the listeners. Then Friday night, Greg Laurie was there, and Greg gave a great message, and several hundred people came forward at the invitation. It's very well heavily attended, and on Saturday, um, had an opportunity to be on the radio and uh, interviewed, and not so much interviewed, but um, I was part of a panel answering questions. There were four pastors on a panel. And uh, now, again, I want to develop this with you for just a moment because uh, there were four of us pastors on a panel, and listeners are, are sending in questions that they would like the panelists to answer. One of the questions that we were asked to answer related to giving away our faith and they were saying, how do you learn to share your faith with other people? Can you give to us some insight into that? So the men began to share some things related to giving away your faith. And, and so I stepped in when it was my opportunity, and I said this. I said, how many of you listen to us on the radio? And then hands went up, and I said, that's great. I said, how many of you... Uh, know what my wife's name is. And they raised their hand. And I said, could you please tell me what her name is? And they said, Marie. And all these people are yelling out, Marie. And I said, how did you know her name? And now we're in Jersey. We're not here in California or in this church. We're in New Jersey. And I said, how did you know her name? And they said, you talk about her. I said, do you know why I talk about her? They got quiet. I said, because she pays me to. <laughs> she says, talk about me. I said, do you know that I don't even realize that I do? Did you know that? I don't realize that I do. It's just part of my life. It comes out. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I said, I don't do that to endear you to my wife or my wife to you. I do that because that's where my heart is. And as I'm sharing, it just so happens that I mention the things that mean most to me. You want to know how to give away your faith? Fall in love with Jesus Christ. When you're in love with Jesus, you're going to talk about him. Now, I do think it important to memorize scriptures, to know ways to be able to show your faith in the Bible. It's not just, oh, I love him, he loves me. You want him? Okay, let's pray. There are scriptures that we can have. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's appointed unto men to die once after this, the judgment. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you confess the Lord Jesus, there are many scriptures that you can tie together as you share, but fall in love with the Lord. It is not that difficult to speak about the one you love. You don't have to, you know, be seated there going, oh, am I going to talk about Jesus? I don't know how. How am I going to do that? Oh, you don't have to do that. You're just talking to somebody. They say, you know, what did you do this week? And oh, I was in church. Really? Why? Well, you know, I'm a believer. I love the Lord. It's that natural. It's not like, oh, Lord, open the doors of opportunity in the name of Jesus. It's just conversation. And don't get caught up like you're some salesman. You've got to close the deal. <laughs> just share the Lord. And I have no doubt in my mind that somewhere as this man's mouth is opened and he hears, what would you say? What would you say to the Lord? I'd say thank you. Wouldn't you? Thank you, Jesus. I can speak. I can eat. I can hear. My tongue has been loosed. And with my tongue, I will praise you. Thank you, Jesus. That's how it works. Fall in love with the Lord. Fall in love with the Lord. And he can. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people, Psalm 35, 18. 
Well, notice in verse 36, he commanded them that they should tell no one. <laughs> but the more he commanded, the more widely they proclaimed it. This has happened before. He had cleansed the leper. The leper went out and spoke. And people are now marveling at what the Lord has done. But when he said, don't speak, the reaction was one of disobedience because they're actually stealing blessings from others and they're missing the point. Remember, he came to save not only to physically heal people. There's a story of a, of a crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. He had been there for some 38 years and the Lord Jesus Christ performed a healing on him. And later on, Jesus, it says in John 5, 14, found this man in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. There's something worse than being crippled, and that is perishing without God. So you can walk, but make sure your walk is straight and towards the Lord. And as this is taking place, they, according to verse 37, were astonished beyond measure, and they said, he has done all things well. He has done all things excellently. He has done all things beautifully. And so, I'll close by turning you back, those of you who turned with me to Mark. I'll close by looking at verse 31, where it says in Matthew 15, 31, the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, the blind seeing. Now notice verse 31, and they glorified the God of Israel. The multitude marveled. They were awestruck. This enormous crowd desiring to be touched by Jesus, these Gentile pagans like the Canaanite had an opportunity to experience the grace of God. And this portion of scripture gives us four things as I conclude, four things that I want to show you, four insights, and I'll just touch them briefly as I conclude. First, this passage reveals to me that Jesus is approachable. Great multitudes came to him, he ministered to them. Not only did they come, but they brought people with him because he's approachable. Jesus invites us to come. Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. So Jesus is approachable. Second, he's able to meet needs. Notice again, they brought to him those who were helpless. The word lame there that is used is a word that includes includes mutilation. It can speak of being deprived of a foot. These people may have included those who were crippled by others, but God made them to walk. We're talking of physical healings here. But some of us in this church have been crippled by other people. I'm speaking to some right now who have been crippled by other people. And you can't really walk healthily. You haven't walked healthily. You can, but you haven't. Because somebody told you when you were growing up that you're worthless. Somebody told you should have aborted you. Somebody told you when you were growing up that you were ugly, you were overweight, that you had a bad complexion, I mean, you can go through all the things that people can with cruelty say to you. You're stupid. You're ignorant. You're the wrong color. One thing after another, and you can hear that your whole life. You'll never amount to anything. Why do we even try? You're never going to do anything. You can't be anything. Look at your dad. Your dad's messed up. You're going to be just like your father. Look at him. You'll never have anything. You'll never be anything. You have heard that. Not all of you. Some of you have. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. You're nothing. You'll amount to nothing. You are crippled. But Jesus makes the lame to walk. I don't have to listen to what man says. I have a God who says, I love you. I'll transform your life. I'll make you worth something. Because in me, you can do all things. Because I will strengthen you. You are brand new in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
You can be in the, in the hand of God. You can be used. He is the, we are the clay. He is the potter. He is the one who fashions us. And I can say to those who have said to me, you're nothing. I can say, you know, you're right, 100%. I am nothing, but in Christ, I have everything that I need. I can say that, and I do say that because he has transformed my life, and he'll transform yours too. People have a tendency of mutilating other people. We're like those, those crabs that are caught when people are out there catching crabs. They throw them in the bucket, and one of the crabs is crawling over the other ones to get to the top so it can get out of that bucket. But those crowds reach up and grab it and pull it back down because that's what people will do. They will not rise and they don't want you to either. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, I've been set free and I can rise above those circumstances and be what he's called me to be. I hope somebody heard that because you need to. Jesus Christ is the answer. He does transform us. You don't know my story. I don't really tell it to you. You know things, but you don't know all the things. Of course, why would you? Why would you even care? But I can tell you that. I thought I was stupid. I grew up thinking I was stupid. And unlovable. Nobody loved me. That's how I felt. Stupid, not worth anything. Stupid and not worth anything. I got saved. Went in the army. They gave us a battery of tests. Some of you veterans know the tests I'm speaking of. They come up to me, this stupid kid who only read comic books, who was loaded from the time I was 15, 16 years old, an alcoholic by the time I was 17. Graduated high school with a D minus average. And they walked up to me and they said, Rosales, in the battery of tests that we gave, you have a propensity to learn languages. We want to send you to the Monterey School of Languages so that you can be a translator serving in the United States Army as a translator. You can learn languages. Because I was one of the few people that in that testing was able to do it. And I said, oh, really? No, thank you. I don't want to spend any more time in the military than I have to. They come up again and they say, Rosales, we want to send you to West Point. You have passed a battery, and we want to put you into West Point. You're appointed to West Point. You can become a military officer. What's required of you is nine years of service, but you can leave the service in nine years as a captain. Appointed to West Point, some of you don't understand what that means. That's one of the highest honors you can have. One of the highest honors that you can have. And I was there, 20 years old, feeling stupid. And the Lord was saying, you aren't as stupid as you think you are. I've made all things new. You're not stupid, David. I can use you. And I'm telling you, don't let the world tell you what you can or cannot do. Let the Lord speak to you, and he will show you great and mighty things that you don't know. He will. I hope that encourages you. Jeremiah 32, 27, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Third, he was worth making the effort for. Effort for. No matter what the sacrifice, it isn't always easy to come to him, made it necessary for them to overcome hardship to even get to him. It must have been difficult to make this journey with so many crippled people. Listen, it's difficult just to take a vacation, let alone bring someone with such challenges. You know what I've discovered? I've, I've, I finally understood when I had kids, I finally understood how difficult it is and why my dad was always mad on vacations. I finally discovered why dad was mad. He was mad because of us, because all the complaining. It's hard sometimes to take a journey with just regular people. How about those with real needs? And so it must have been real difficult for them to come. But don't you think Jesus is worth it? I do. I do. My wife, 
Marie, did you know I have a wife named Marie? I, my wife, <laughs> this church started 35 years ago. We had a four-year-old Corinne, a two-year-old David, and a three-month-old by the name of Joseph when this church began. Four years, two years, three months. Mama, you understand those numbers, don't you? It's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work. Four-year-old by itself is hard. My Stella's four. She's going to be four? Oh. Four-year-olds are a handful. Two-year-olds? Mm. Three months, not so bad. They don't do anything other than this. <laughs> Marie was here on Sunday morning, Wednesday night. When we started Sunday nights, she was there Sunday nights. She made the sacrifice and the effort because she knew it was worth it. And a lot of parents don't. And they wonder why their kids are not serving Jesus. It's because mom and dad didn't understand how important it was for them to be in an environment that is contrary to the flow of the world. And then they wonder when the kid turns 17 why he doesn't want to go to church anymore. It's because it was foreign to him in the home. Parents, let me encourage you. You don't have to come to our Bible studies. Go to Bible studies during the week. I'm not trying to build up numbers in my Bible study. I'm trying to build you up, and I'm trying to build your family up. Because we, when those kids had high school, we held on for dear life because it's rough. And to this day, my wife and I pray for our children daily that God will do a work in their life. And all of them are adults with children of their own, except for Joseph. Joseph and Carino don't have a child yet, so they, I've written them out of my will. <laughs> it's worth the effort. Finally, he's gracious. He didn't turn them away. He touched them. Psalm 116, verse 5, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. One thing we need to remember about the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was said in Mark 7, 37, He does everything well. And the result will always be the multitude will marvel. Someone said, When blind souls are made to see by faith, the mute to speak in prayer and praise, the maimed and the lame to walk in holy obedience, it is to be marveled at.